Welcome to the Jesus Movement Live. Uh, welcome to everyone who's joining us online. Well, welcome to everybody who's joining us here today. Uh, today we're on our 19th uh, sermon from our series, A Gospel According to John. And the title today is a difficult one. And it's, of course, that Jesus is crucified. You see? And so in the Gospel of John, one of the things that sets the Gospel of John apart is that everything he says is in order that whoever reads the word will believe. That's the point. So the Gospels put together give us a total picture, but John has a very specific point of view. John also has a couple of names that he uses for himself when he doesn't speak his own name. Anyone remember what any of them are? The one Jesus loved. The one that Jesus loved the most. Yeah, the most. Right? The most. <laughs> So, uh, so that's an incredible uh, title, and that actually comes up again today in, in the teaching. And so sometimes we r- realise through these words who is actually with Jesus in these actual times. Mm. Okay. Now, just as we begin, uh, because we're teaching from the Gospel according to John, uh, we just put up this little uh, chart uh, for the beginning this at uh, this point in time we're in the, what's called the book of glory and that's because this is the stage where jesus goes to glory prior to that we were in the book of signs because this is where the seven miraculous signs of jesus are covered in the gospel according to john the prologue of the introduction where they were introduced to jesus that he was here in the beginning is the word was the word and is the word etc and then of course we go into the conclusion and the epilogue later but uh, today we're pretty much um into almost the very end of the Book of Glory, obviously, because we're at that stage of the crucifixion and the the death and burial of Jesus. Now, in our previous sermon called Jesus is Arrested and Sentenced, uh, from John chapter 18 uh, through to 19, verse 16, Jesus left the guest house where he celebrated the Passover with his disciples and then left the city of Jerusalem on foot to the place where he spent many nights in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. After praying three times to his father, Jesus is arrested by Roman soldiers and temple police and taken first to Annas, then to his son-in-law, the high priest Caiaphas, and then to both Pontius Pilate and Herod Antipas to be judged. So he actually passes through four lots of authorities. I'll ask a quick question. Why did he go to Annas first? Some of you know the answer to this. Why did he go to Annas first? And who was Annas? Well, it said here that Caiaphas was his son-in-law. So Annas is obviously the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the current high priest of Jerusalem. So why did he go to Annas? Because he was the high priest. Right. And he's um, the the major in authority. And he gave that authority to um, his son-in-law. Right. Thank you. So it's like... It was almost like a dynasty, like a family dynasty. So Annas was the high priest of Jerusalem between AD 6 and 15. He had four sons who were all high priests, and then Caiaphas, his son-in-law, became the high priest. So basically they controlled the treasury, they controlled the temple, they controlled even the people who would beat people with staves, as, as the words of the time would say. And so we find that Annas was the person behind the Sanhedrin, behind the Council of Jews, who was actually pulling the strings and controlling everything. He didn't actually have the final authority, of course. He did with his family, Mm -hmm. and he did with the temple, but at the end of the day, it had to go through the formal channels. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus was handed over to Caiaphas, who then judged him because they were looking for a reason to condemn him and to have him arrested and sentenced to death. And so finally, they got to the point where they called him out on blasphemy because he conceded that, yes, in fact, he was the king and so they said that's it we don't need any more witnesses we're going to take him to Pontius Pilate of course he takes him to Pontius Pilate and Pontius Pilate who's known as a person who uh, murders people without trial giving them a fair trial in this case we find that he can find nothing wrong with Jesus that warrants him being uh, murdered and so he passes him off he learns that Herod Antipas is in town so because Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth and Antipas rules the region of Nazareth He says, well, I'll pop pop him over there and he can take responsibility for Jesus. So Herod has his turn with him and sends him back and says, I can't find any fault with him. And so he ends up back with Pontius Pilate. And so the story goes 
that these people scream for him to be crucified. And so Pilate, of course, he offers an alternative. He comes up with a fellow by the name of Barabbas. And Barabbas was a murderer who was part of an uprising and he killed a Roman citizen. And so he was known as an insurrectionist. And so he was the top of the pile as far as the Romans concerned because they were trying to stamp out people who wanted to see the end. And so as a consequence of this, he, there was a custom on Passover where a prisoner would be chosen to be released back to the people. And so what happened? It was manipulated so that this Barabbas would actually be given back. Now the point here is that the people got it, uh, sorry, not the people, Pontius Pilate got it really wrong. So he thought that this guy was a murderer and people would release him instead of Jesus. But the fact is the Jews saw him as a freedom fighter because he was killing Romans. And so they said, well, we'll keep him. Let's get rid of Jesus. And so this is what ends up happening. But because Pontius Pilate's conscience says this is wrong, what does he do? He washes his hands in the water symbolically. They say, I have nothing to do with this. The responsibility lies with you. And the Jews foolishly say, we will wear that responsibility. And so will our children. And of course, history unfolds from there. And so this is the story of what happened. So Pontius Pilate, though, he decides that he will have Jesus flogged. In other words, he will show solidarity with the Jews and say, I am going to punish him, but the sentence of death is yours. The hard part to get your head around is what the flogging actually was, because it was so severe that it ripped the skin off his body and exposed his ribs. And the, and the scriptures tell us that he came back and he was so marred and disfigured that you couldn't even barely recognize him as a human being. Mm-hmm. They put the, 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 the crown of thorns on his head. They beat him in the face with a wooden stave. Could you imagine what that would do to you? Mm-hmm. And so he was just a bloody pulp. And they put the purple robes over him like he was a king and mocked him and brought them back before the people. And they said, crucify him, crucify him still. The most appalling thing. Mm-hmm. And so today... This brings us up to where we're up to today. So I'm going to get you to open your Bibles to John chapter 19. And we're going to be reading from uh, verse 16b, actually, the the last component of verse 16 uh, is the beginning of the scripture for today. We're going to read through to verse 27. Uh, Here's the scripture reference behind. So John chapter 19, 16b, the second component of verse 16, through to verse 27. Okay, so it reads, Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle, Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin and Greek. Interesting that the scriptures tell you that it was written in three languages. I'm going to explain why. It reads on the chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment, now take note of this, this garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. So in other words, there's five articles of clothing altogether. There's four soldiers. Each of the soldiers take one article of clothing left, and then there's the undergarment, which they're going to share, or they're going to determine who's going to have it. And so it reads on, This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, They divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my clothing. It's from Psalm 22, verse 18, and we're going to come back and read a bit about that. So this is what the soldiers did. So you understand what that implication of that is? It says, this is what the soldiers did. This was his only undergarment, his only undercovering. And so it was actually removed. So you want to talk about being humiliated. This is what they did. 
So near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Of course, the disciple isn't named once again. We're in the book of John. So my question to you to start off with is what stands out for you in the crucifixion of Jesus? What things amongst this ring resonate with you or stands out for you? He wanted to console his mother. He wanted to console his mother. Amazing, isn't it? So yeah. he's been crucified and he's still focused on others. Obviously, he wants his mother taken care of. Mm. But it's not the only person he's actually focused on mm. because he has two criminals on mm. the crosses beside him. Extraordinary. It's very good. Mm. Anything else? Any other thoughts? Uh, I was shocked to hear about all the garments. I never realised that. Right. I never, See, I never read John like that before. See, if you read it carefully, you realise four soldiers, four garments, That's one fine. undergarment, and they're vying for the undergarment. The undergarment is anything left to cover him. It's, it's funny, isn't it? It's, um, it's, it just goes through, and the, all, full, you know, all the scriptures are getting fulfilled just as all this is yeah. right. coming, right. coming about. And, and you're reading this specifically, specifically, specifically in the yeah. book of John. Mm. And the reason is because? We can glorify him. He's writing it because he wants that people who read it will believe. believe. believe yeah. It is the purpose for the book of John. He mm. says so, and we'll come to that scripture a little bit later. But he actually says so himself. Everything he writes is so that people will believe. believe. He's not just writing another account. Mm. There's three accounts already. Mm. And they vary according to the experience. Some of them don't know Jesus firsthand, of course. John does. Mm. And yet John... Even though he does, he's actually the one who omits a lot of details. Mm. But he omits them because he doesn't see them as significant because his purpose is to write the things that people can believe that Jesus is the Messiah from. Mm. Okay, so in verse 17 that we've just read, it says that Jesus has to carry his own cross. Mm. Now, it was Roman custom for a convicted man to carry his cross from the place of sentencing to the place of crucifixion. Before the Romans put a man on the cross, they first put the cross on the man, and they forced him to carry it in a public procession intended to draw attention to the condemned, to his crime, and to his fate. Now, I could ask the obvious question, but obviously they want people to be fearful and not commit these crimes, and so they make a public parade of those who are condemned. So I'm going to put up a picture for you. And we saw this in the previous uh, message. And it actually shows this stone of Gabbatha, right? this paved area. <coughs> Here's Pontius Pilate up top. Here's the high priest here. You can see the room. So you notice that there's two criminals either side of him. They both have the cross beam. And I'll give you the name of them, strapped onto their shoulders. And yet here behind, what do you see? You see the full cross. Now this is the normal method for crucifixion. But this is what Jesus is faced with. Okay? So it's significantly different. So my question to you is it was normally the cross piece, and it's called the patibulum, P-A-T-I-B-U-L-U-M. The patibulum, the cross member they carry, not the complete gibbet, which is the post. Why do you think they made Jesus carry the complete cross to Golgotha, the site of crucifixion? It's uh, in the Old Testament for prophecy that he has to be lifted up high. Right, well, they're all going to get lifted up high, so that's not the case. Not that one, no. That's okay, that's good. Was, it, was there anything to do with the fact that it was originally for Barabbas? Well done. Oh, that's, that's exactly right. And why? Because he was the ringleader? Because he was a person who murdered a Roman. Yeah. 
So the others committed crimes, they tried to do things, and they got condemned and, and crucified, but this guy actually killed a Roman. Mm. So they wanted to punish him punish even further. And so they had this complete cross built for Barabbas, and he was known, as I mentioned, as an insurrectionist, literally a form of freedom fighter who chose to murder Romans. Because he succeeded in murdering a Roman in an uprising, Pontius Pilate especially wanted to make an example of him and make him suffer as a warning to anyone else who sought to kill Roman citizens. The unfortunate outcome of this is that when he was released and Jesus was condemned in his place, he was burdened in a greater way than the two criminals he is to be crucified with. Sad, isn't it? But it's the circumstances under which these events took place. So in John's account, it does not tell of the journey in between. You may notice this, as I've mentioned. But in Matthew 27, verse 32, and it's just a single uh, scripture, it's up here on the screen. It says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Now you can just imagine the state that Jesus is actually in. Okay, and there's that huge cross there. Yeah. It says there that as they were going out, now there's some assumptions there outside of the city walls, outside of this um, area which the Romans actually used to conduct their business. Right, it was called the Praetorium. It was the place where Pontius Pilate lived. It's where they arrested and sentenced and, and conducted their business basically, and it's right next to where they garrisoned their soldiers next to the Temple of Jerusalem. I'm going to put another image up to give you some sort of understanding. And we see these in the movies that are shown. Jesus attempting to drag this huge cross through. And of course he's falling down. He's weak. He's in a terrible state. And these soldiers are beating him, trying to get him to pick up the cross once again. Of course, he doesn't have the physical capacity to do so anymore. And so the soldiers who are frustrated by being stopped, and you can see the other fellow behind here, uh, frustrated at, at being stopped, they assign Simon, a, a Cyrenian, to come and carry the cross for him. So Jesus, scourged and beaten to win the breath of his life, is incapable of carrying or dragging the cross to Golgotha. So this man called Simon from Siren is forced, the scripture says, he doesn't have a choice, to carry the cross for him. In verse 18 that we've just read, in John chapter 19, it says that Jesus is crucified. Now crucifixion is the most horrific form of execution. And yet you will notice the gospel writers, and take note of this, they don't dwell on the detail. They don't try and give you all the gory detail like we do in modern times with movies. They don't actually do that. They just give you a sequence mm. of events. And the reason is because their purpose is to provide an account of what happened, not to manipulate your emotions. I think we can have our own emotional reaction to what we're hearing. Mm. But they're not trying to do that. They're just there to tell you exactly what was going on, to simply tell the story. So they themselves were very familiar, you have to realise this, they were very familiar with the practice. The Romans were crucifying people on a regular basis. They would see this around the land. But their focus is not, and this is the point, their focus as gospel writers, they know Jesus, they're not focused on the outward and physical suffering as we would perhaps do today. And that's why we seek the emotional response in messages. The fact is, that they're more concerned about the anguish and spiritual suffering that tormented Jesus the most. So my question to you is, amidst the abhorrent physical pain that Jesus is suffering, what is the spiritual suffering that torments Jesus the most? This well, is the very answer of why is Jesus going to the cross? For, yeah, for me, it's, it's the fact that he's taking on our sins and he's done nothing wrong. I mean, when if you think about how you feel if somebody calls you something you're not or right. accuses you of something you, right. you haven't mm. done, right. the feeling alone just for that, but 
Right. But to take on everybody's sin and everything that everybody's done, just it's huge, isn't it? Yeah. Massive. For doing nothing. Yeah, it's extraordinary. Mm. And so here, that's what we have to do. We have to see the purpose in all of this. As we've been going through, we've been making very clear that Jesus is in control. He is God. Right? He is choosing to go to the cross. He's not being taken to the cross. Mm. He's letting them do this. Remember, in our previous message, I spoke about how in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers came up and he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus from Nazareth. He said, I am. And they, they, fell over. they all fell over. Amazing. The very presence of God in front of them knocked them all down. And then as they got up, Peter got up excited, chopped the guy's ear off from behind. Malchus, the servant of the high priest, Caiaphas. And Jesus leans over, touches his ear and heals his ear again. So the scriptures tell us that he could have called... Thousands, I think it, it was, uh, uh, it was, was it six legions or is equivalent to 300,000 yeah, angels who could have come and fought for him? Mm. But he didn't no. because he was going to the cross. He had to do. Yeah. He had to do right. right. And so this isn't about Jesus being incapacitated or incapable. And you have to realize that he's literally biting his lip and allowing these things to happen yeah. as they go along. The thing is, you have to realize here is everybody's seeing a man of the flesh, even up to now. Mm. Everything you see, you identify with because you think if it was me as a person of the flesh, how horrific would your suffering be? Mm. But Jesus' suffering is not about his physical state because mm. he knows that's going to pass and he will be renewed. Mm. Right? Jesus knows that when this is passed, he goes back to the Father. In other words, he goes back to the world that he actually knows, mm. right? not the world that we live in. Mm. So his perspective is completely different to ours. Mm. But because well, he also knows that they don't know what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Right. They don't understand because they don't believe he is who he is. Yeah. And therein lies the issue. Mm. So the purpose for Jesus dying on the cross is to atone for our sins and thus defeat the devil mm. who had separated mankind from God and condemned them to hell from the very first Adam. And so of course Jesus is known as the second Adam, and this time he's going to defeat the devil once and for all. So crucifixion is a form of execution reserved for the worst criminals. In other words, they didn't crucify everybody. It is designed to make the victim die publicly. That's what this is about. Slowly, with great pain and the big word, humiliation. And this is the form of death that God ordained for Jesus to die. Although Jesus walked this earth as a man of the flesh, you can't help but wonder at his extraordinary will to go to the cross and suffer intentionally for each of us. So crucifixion was so awful and degrading that polite Romans wouldn't talk about it in public. The Roman statesman Cicero said this of crucifixion. He said, It is a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is an act of wickedness. To execute him is almost murder. What shall I say of crucifying him? An act so abominable, it is impossible to find any word adequately to express. And this is a Roman statesman. So it's the other end of the scale of brutality. I mean, it's absolutely abhorrent. Now, a Roman historian called Tacitus said, a torture fit only for slaves. So they didn't consider slaves as equals. They considered them like animals. And so he says that it's a torture fit for slaves. But what's this word? He uses the word torture. He's admitting that this isn't just killing someone or putting them down. This is torture. This is designed to create pain of the worst kind. And so Tacitus makes this comment as well. Now in 1968, archaeologists discovered the remains of a man crucified in the era of Jesus. And you see all the illustrations that I'm putting up. But this tells you now exactly how it was done. The study of the remains revealed that the victim is actually nailed to the cross in a sitting position. Both legs are sideways, so they're turned sideways, with the nail penetrating the sides of both feet just below the heel. Okay, so in other words, they're scrunched up in a sitting position with their legs turned and nailed through sideways through both of the heels. Okay. 
Now the arms are stretched out and each are stabbed by a nail not in the hands but actually in the forearms. Okay. This is actually what makes me not believe in God and Jesus. If I was ever going to be an atheist, it would be the crucifixion really because I can't understand how they're savages. These people are sav nothing more but savages of some abominable type to be able to do that to another human being to inflict such horridness. How, how can you ever believe that there is a God when the human beings are doing that to other human beings? Because it's not God who's doing it. Mm. There there's that the, many devils on the earth? Well, there's a third of the there's fallen the angels that came with Satan to mm. roam the earth. How forget about them? Because it's just, it's just hard to fathom that there's such... Evil. I mean, I'd probably be one there too. That's what astounds me the most. I'd probably be in the crowd there too. You know? It, it's I bewildering, isn't it? it? It's... I can't fathom yep. the depth of... But these are the that. common sort of things that get spoken of where people's faith is challenged because they think, if there is a God, why doesn't he stop it? Mm. You have to realise that he actually sacrificed himself to stop it. Yeah. Mm. So this but is on another level beyond yeah, that's the our. This is the whole point. That you beyond, have to, you have to go to right. truly take that in. That beyond world. our comprehension. Yeah, that's exactly why. But you have to realise that when you go to heaven, the scriptures tell us that it is also beyond our comprehension. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <That's right>. See, <laughs> part of the hard it. thing is, <laughs> yeah. as human beings, we can have a belief in something. But it doesn't necessarily mean that we have the ability to comprehend what yeah, it's like. Yeah. Right? Our whole framework is of a natural world. Mm. And so most of our thoughts are of a natural kind. Shallow. Right? But in the spiritual world and the acknowledgement that there is a spiritual world, mm. therein lies our faith. Mm -hmm. And therein lies what we cannot see in a tangible way. Mm. And so this is why it's called faith. Because we believe that there's something more than what we can see, taste, touch, or smell. Okay? And so this, this is where we get into the supernatural and the extraordinary. And this is why Jesus went to the cross. Because why? Because he rose again three days later. He showed that the burdens of the flesh can be overcome. That it's not the end. And so our fear in life is always of death. It's the biggest fear of anyone. Because they see it as the end. Right? Once I'm dead, that's it. Mm. That's the natural speaking. Mm -hmm. But in the spiritual, we know that we leave our body behind mm -hmm. and our soul continues on. Mm -hmm. And so to accept that is actually to put a pragmatic outcome into your belief mm. that goes beyond the natural and into the supernatural. Okay. Mm. You have to understand that there is something there. That's what gives us hope. Right? Why would you do many, many things in life if you didn't think that there was an outcome for it at the end? Right? That's what our faith is about. You know, if you want to be really blunt, if we've all got it really wrong, right, no difference. But if we've got it right, there's a big difference. what do we say? And so when we have a supernatural faith and we have an encounter with the Lord and the Holy Spirit enters into us, this is how... We know that we're Christ-centered because there is the Lord within us. Mm. And so it's not something we just speak about. It's something that's not just words. It's something that is in deeds. And so when we become a believer, we change. We change how we act. We change how we speak. Mm. We change what we do for others. And in there lies Christ. Mm. That's why we call it Christ-like. Right. Because when he leaves, he doesn't leave us on his own, on our own. He sends the Holy Spirit to comfort us mm -hmm. and for us to remember him and everything that he actually said. Mm -hmm. And so when we teach the word of God, my job here is not to convince you of anything. Mm -hmm. It is here to share the gospel because we believe that the gospel will speak to you. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that does it, not me. Mm -hmm. There is no convincing in our faith.
Mm -hmm. You have a free will. You have a free will decision, and that is yours to take. And so overcoming our faith is usually easier when people stop trying to convince you and allow you to breathe mm -hmm. and to actually have a relationship yourself because that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Your relationship with God does not come through another. It comes directly between you and the Lord. Amen. Okay. That's what I try and tell him. All right. <laughs> and so when, we, so when we share and we love one another and we help one another, they're all the fruits of our faith and our belief. And that's how people can see on us that Christ is within us. Mm -hmm. right? If you say that you're a believer and you don't change one iota, then I'd probably say, I don't believe you. Absolutely. Right? There has to be change. Yes. There has to be things that you correct and change as a result of your faith. That's right. And if you don't, then you're not walking with the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's that right. simple. Mm -hmm. right? And so we have to recognize that within ourselves and we have to change. I mean, just last week when Jesus was with his disciples, three times he goes away to pray. Every time he comes back, they're asleep. <laughs> the Bible tells us they're sleeping because they're so sorrowful. Mm. Right? Okay. They're sad. They've had a very stressful day. They've had a very long day. Yeah. And they're probably hiding in their sleep, right? But the thing is, is that what did he say to them? He said to pray to the Father in order to avoid temptation. Mm. Right? So he gives us tools to use in order to stay outside of the world and be mm. a person aligned with the Spirit. Mm. So the thing is, is that if something's happening in your life, he tells us to pray because while you're focused on the Father, you're not focused on all those other things. Mm -hmm. right? So Jesus is a practical teacher. Mm -hmm. He gives us the way to do things in order to practice our faith. If you don't know how to pray, he says, here's the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> right? And if you're going to take communion, he says, you better forgive others before you take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. He tells you everything that you need to do. Mm -hmm. okay? yeah. There's no guessing game. There's no, I've got to pray so many times a day. Mm -hmm. right? There's none of this religious stuff. Right? It's just really, really simple. He gives good instruction. Right. It's very, very clear and very, very simple. Okay. So, as I was talking about this position on the cross, it's described as a difficult and unnatural posture meant to increase the pain of the sufferer. On the vertical post, there's a horn like projection called the sedil, which the crucified man straddles to take some of the weight of his body and prevent the flesh from tearing from the nails. So they show that in most illustrations as the feet being on it. That's right. right? But the feet being on it means the whole body weight is still... Mm. So they say there's something for them to sit on, which means takes the weight off the legs. Mm. But the legs are still nailed to the actual cross. Mm. Right? So this is how it's actually done. So it takes some of the weight and prevents the flesh from tearing from the nails. So without going into any more details, because that's not the purpose, right? the crucifixion is horrific. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason that we go into some details and give you some sort of a picture is because this is what God has for mm -hmm. him. Because he's suffering for all of mankind's sins. How do you quantify that? And so it is horrific. But there's another thing about it being so horrific. We still talk about it to this day. Right? If it was a, you know, like a modern death where people give someone a needle, and a, no one would probably ever talk about it ever again. It would be forgotten once it left the news. Mm -hmm. But this, 2,000 years later, and people are it's still serious. describing it. <laughs> right? It's horrific. Now, also in verse 18, we learn that Jesus is crucified between two others. There were three people scheduled for crucifixion that day, Barabbas and two others, and Jesus had taken the place of Barabbas. Although the account of John doesn't talk about the two others, I'm not going to read them, but I'll give you the references. Matthew 27, verse 38, and Mark 15, verse 27, says that they were two robbers who were crucified with him. So the big cross was intended for a murder of a Roman, and the, the ones carrying the cross beam who were crucified beside him were 
robbers. Mm -hmm. So in other words, their crime was something considered as less than that of Barabbas. But the account given by Luke reveals that the whole of humanity was actually crucified on the cross. Why? Because not only did Jesus, the sinless saviour, die in the middle, but the condemned and impenitent dies on one side, whilst the saved penitent dies on the other side. One gave his life to the Lord, and the other one mocked the Lord. Can you imagine you're hanging on a cross, being crucified by the Romans, and you're mocking the person next to you? So the other fellow says, you're a bit of an idiot, mate. This is the Messiah. So now he acknowledges on the cross that he's Messiah. Okay, so these three people encapsulate the whole the whole of humanity. Right. Wow. Jesus, the man of the flesh, right. without sin, dies on the cross between those who give their life to the Lord and those who don't. Wow. Three crosses, oh, wow. all there represented. Wow. Now, Luke twenty-three, verses thirty-nine to forty-three explains, and all of this is on the screen. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, this is the same insults the chief priests were hurling at them. Something his reference point is, and us, because he's on the cross. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. So he's acknowledging his sin. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Mm. Jesus answered, and truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, it's that simple. Yeah. Conviction. See, today we have sometimes a very long process, as we call it, for people to give their life to the Lord. Mm. This guy's running out of time very quickly, obviously. <laughs> so he's very committed. That is the <laughs> right. right. So... So I get that. <laughs> However, the resistance that people have to faith is very long-winded sometimes. Yeah, right. And so what we're saying, although we teach the Word and the Bible is huge, clearly. Mm. Right? We gain knowledge and we gain wisdom and we help people. The thing is, though, is that it's not what saves us. Mm. The written Word and why we learn this is so that you can know that Jesus is the Messiah. The Old Testament or the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, is everything leading up to the Messiah coming. Yeah. It's all about the Messiah. Right. Right? And so there's a purpose in this. This is a purpose in this Gospel of John's because he wants us to believe it's the Messiah because he's fulfilling the prophetic, messianic promises mm -hmm. from right. the earlier time on this planet. Mm -hmm. right. So Jesus never distanced himself, and this is the thing here, Jesus never distanced himself from common people. In fact, he came for the sinner. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. His enemies saw him there on the cross suffering and dying with common criminals. That's what they saw. Like people of the flesh. They thought they were righteous and they mocked him whilst his disciples, what did they do? They forsook him. They took off. Mm -hmm. And yet, to his last, last breath, Jesus is still centred among sinners. And whilst one of them mocks him, even though he too hangs on the cross, the other rebukes him, accepts he has sinned, and receives salvation. So the message for you today is, it's never too late. It's never too late. Don't let anyone tell you that you've done too much wrong. That's the devil speaking. So Jesus is centered between God and man. He took the punishment that our sin deserves, and on the cross he presents himself as both the high priest and the offering, at the same time. Please, whatever you do, and this is the point, never look upon Jesus with pity. Because this is why he came. Mm. Jesus actually came to win the greatest victory on earth Amen. and its people has ever seen. Amen. Huh? Mm -hmm. So when we look upon all this and we feel the pain and the suffering because we can understand what it, well, we can't understand it, but yeah. we, we, we dread what it would be like. Yeah. Jesus says, don't pity me. He says, I came to do this for you. Yeah. You know, this time will pass. It's good teaching, isn't it? Because there's things that happen in life sometimes where you get into that moment where you can't see your way out the other end. Yeah. 
and often pity comes into it. Mm. Now, self-pity is actually a sin. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us. Why? Because you place yourself first. Poor me. Mm -hmm. right? And so Jesus tells us not to have self-pity. Mm. And he doesn't want pity from people either. No. Because he came for a victory, not for a pity party. Mm. Okay? And so when we're being seduced often in ministry by people who want to be absorbed in self-pity, Oftentimes, pastors and members of the clergy will not engage with those people. And people will say, can you believe it? I've got all these problems and the pastor just walked away from me. <laughs> Think about it. Because he's not there to engage in pity. Right. He's there to overcome pity. Mm. Mm -hmm. But you have a free will. Yeah. He can't change that for you. But you can. Mm -hmm. And so we have to engage. So in verse 19, it tells us that Pontius Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. Now many people think that he was the only one who had a title on the cross, right? Pictures only show a picture above Jesus' head mm -hmm. with a title on it, but not the two criminals with him. Mm. Not, not true. Right. Okay. Again, this is where we need context. Although scripture mentions the two thieves were crucified with Jesus, it doesn't say anything about them receiving titles. But this is only because the count is focused on Jesus. It was Roman custom that every man being crucified had his crime written out. And after initially hanging it around his neck as he carried his cross to the place of death, so when they were paraded through the streets, it was hung around their neck. When they arrived at the place of death, the title was then placed on the top of the cross. So all would know the reason for the crucifixion. So in other words, here's the man's crime, here's his punishment. You do this, this is what happens to you. That's what the Romans were doing. And so this plaque was not just for Jesus. It was for all people who were convicted. So the words for Jesus said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And this is the irony here. So Pilate wrote the name of Jesus, the same name by which he was identified and arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, in John chapter 18, verse 5. Right? He also wrote what was said to be the crime of Jesus, and that he claimed to be the king of the Jews in John 18, verses 33 to 34. So when it said Jesus from Nazareth, the king of the Jews, it wasn't identifying him. It was saying what his crime was. His crime was to be the king. And so what did this do for the Jews? They didn't like it. Because they didn't want Jesus to be the Jews. So the irony of this, the very thing that he got remembered for, was exactly what the Jews didn't want him remembered for. And that's the king of the Jews. Brilliant. Because the crime that was put up was actually being their king. But he didn't commit a crime. But they had to put something down. Why did he get, why did he get crucified? Because the Jews said that he blasphemed and claimed to be the son of God. And so that's what got put on the name plot. Right. So even in his death, Jesus is identified with a humble and obscure Nazareth, and even in his death, Jesus is recognized as a king. <laughs> Kings of this world take their throne, usually through the death of others. But Jesus is proclaimed king to the whole world through his own death. This title is also a proper justification of the sinless nature of Jesus. On either side are criminals with descriptions of their crimes, robbers. On the cross of Jesus, it simply describes who he is, which is no crime at all, because it is true. <laughs> so in verse 20, it says that many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus is crucified is near the city. Why? Because the Romans want crucifixion to be a public event in which many people would see the wretched victim, read their crime, and be warned. Now the scriptures tell us peculiarly that it's written in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Why do you think that is? Why would they write it in three languages? So they all got the message. Yeah. Right? Was it, was it, um, because it was a trade area. So you you're on to it. So that there's more than one language. Right. Mm. Very good. So Different. specifies three languages. Mm. Pontius Pilate wants this statement regarding Jesus to be as public as possible. This is also how the message of Jesus Christ being crucified and reigning as king will be published to every nation and language. From the beginning, it is a global message for all to read and share with their people back home. 
Aramaic is for the local inhabitants. Latin is for the officials. Remember at this time that Hebrew is only an ecclesiastical language. Okay, it's that of the scriptures and of the high priest and the, and the priesthood. So Aramaic is for the local inhabitants, Latin is for the officials, and Greek is the lingua franca or trading language of the Eastern Mediterranean world. So during the time of the Romans, they still broke, spoke a slang Greek. It never changed. Okay, and that's why the New Testament is written in Greek, Greek because the language of the Bible at the time. Okay. So in verse 21, the chief priests and the Jews objected to Pontius Pilate's title because they felt it is false because they don't believe Jesus is the king of the Jews. <laughs> but Pontius Pilate, who caves into the demands that Jesus be crucified, finally stands up to them on this small matter and inadvertently pronounced who Jesus really is to the world. On a legal note, however, Roman law forbids a pronounced sentence to be altered. And because this inscription that the Jews considered blasphemy is why Jesus is sentenced to death, the Jews now have to put up and shut up because it can't be changed. And there it is for the rest of time. A Roman crucifixion is supervised by soldiers. Now you might remember in the previous teaching we said that uh, Pontius Pilate gave Jesus to over. That means he gave them to the soldiers. Now, they're given to soldiers because they want them to keep order because not everyone's happy about it. People go a bit crazy, jostling and hurling insults and all the rest of it as well. And they're also there to ensure that the condemned person actually dies. Mm -hmm. So when they take the garments of Jesus, he's left with no material possessions as he dies. Men are crucified naked. So verse 23 explains that Jesus is only covered by a loincloth when his other garments are divided into four shares for four soldiers. But the author John goes on to explain the garment is seamless and woven into one piece. A lot of detail, isn't it? But there's a reason why. So the Romans decide not to tear it in verse 24, but rather cast lots to decide who gets it. And this fulfills yet another messianic prophecy that we find in Psalm 22 verse 18 that says they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing so the lots was because there was four articles of clothing and so they probably couldn't decide who had which bit so they cast lots and the divide the, the part where it says the divide of my garments is this issue where they're going to come up one short this the soldiers did the scriptures said so we know then that they actually took this undergarment from Jesus. As the Son of God died for the sins of the world, these soldiers carelessly laughed and played games at his feet. But what we're going to do just now is we're just going to take a moment and read from Psalm 22, not just verse 18 that I put up, but I'm going to read from verse 1 to 18 to hear how Jesus feels and what condition he is in both physically and physically and spiritually so we find this again in psalm 22 i'm going to read it's longer than verse 18 but i'm going to read up to verse 18 and it says and it's familiar words for my for my god my god why have you forsaken me what jesus says on the cross right here it is in psalms this is david wrote this mm -hmm. why are you so far from saving me so far from the words of my groaning he's acknowledging his suffering Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night and am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In your, you, our fathers put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. And he says, but I am a worm and not a man. What do you think he's saying there? I am a worm. Um... He can't tell that he's actually because he's being beaten that badly. He can't tell. He's, he's so he's, disfigured. Yeah, but he's a man. He's so humiliated. He's like nothing. Mm. He's hanging on that cross, bloody and beaten. And he says, "But I am worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him." Let him deliver him since he delights in him. So this is what the Jews said. This David said this a thousand years earlier. Mm -hmm. the, the guy, the criminal on the cross said this to him. 
and the and the priests etc were hurling these insults at him as well a thousand years earlier yet you brought me out of the womb you made me trust in your in you even at my mother's breast from birth i was cast upon you from my mother's womb you have been my god do not be far from me for trouble is near and there is no one to help why is there no one to help his disciples are gone not even his disciples stayed mm. we find out john did but they're all gone. And Jesus said to them all, he said that you'll all abandon me. And so here we go again, a thousand years before. <laughs> Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me, roaring lions, tearing their prey, open their, mou their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water. What happened to Jesus? We haven't come up to it yet. Yes, they shove a spear in his side and blood and water come out. Yeah. Okay. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. That's one of the most hurtful Very things that I read. Because his, shoulder, his arms are pulled yeah, yeah, out of his yeah. shoulders and sockets. Mm. It's just horrific. Yeah. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. This is the scripture about the scourging. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Verse 18. This is Jesus speaking. You're actually hearing how he's feeling in this scripture. He's describing what's been done to his body and what's been, what's been hurled at him. I mean, it's just horrendous, isn't it? But it's just uh, it, 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 it's just grieving. I, I, I don't really even have words. You must notice that this comes before Psalm 23, by the way. So this brings context to Psalm 23. I'm not going to go into it today. But it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. And so on, off it goes. Right. Now the valley of death is actually the Kidron Valley. It's outside... The walls of Jerusalem where Jesus is crucified. Often this is used in funerals and contextual mm. teachings and it's just not dealt with the right way. But that's what it's about. Okay. So finally, in verses 25 to 27, we learn who were there with Jesus as he died on the cross. Mary, the mother of Jesus, his auntie, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. The disciple whom Jesus loved most is the author's way, John, of humbly referring to himself, and he witnesses the crucifixion of Jesus with his own eyes. So this is an eyewitness account of the book of John. Mm. The other disciples write about it, but they weren't there. Mm. He actually is an eyewitness. And as Jesus is dying, his thoughts are still with others, and he communicates to both Mary, his mother, and John, his disciple, that John will take care of his mum relationship mm -hmm. so before we read the next portion of scripture about the death of jesus i'm just going to show you a series of illustrations so that you can see how jesus is crucified and so in this first one this is basically what's happening he's being held down as these steel nails have been driven into his body and so once again you can see how horrific it is as I did mention, this, uh, this notion of this uh, feet being nailed down here, this is actually something that they would sit on. They'd turn the legs sideways and nail through the feet sideways. So unfortunately, through, the, 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 through history, it's changed. Um, but there's plenty of documentation that tells you, and there's actually archaeological evidence for it as well. So, but you can just imagine these poor people, family, and John watching on as this is done to the Messiah. And of course, to Mary and, and Jesus' auntie, to a family member. The next image shows how they actually get across up. They have a hole in the ground. They have a temporary frame, and you can see they actually have these guides, and they basically pull the cross up until suddenly it drops into the hole. The pain would be excruciating, as they say, the word from to crucify. And so he's lifted up by this means. Obviously, this thing is very, very heavy. And so um, 
this is the reality of what people would be witnessing. And you can notice the illustration shows Jerusalem right behind. The next illustration shows the body is upright on the cross and you can see they're driving stakes in around the base of the hole to hold the cross upright. So when they take away the support beams, it will then remain upright of its own accord. You can see, of course, the plaque above his head that was provided by uh, Pontius Pilate. And then following this, the two others were lifted up and they are crucified beside him. You can see this fellow, he's hurling his abuse looking at Jesus. And the other fellow is actually facing towards him and telling him to back off because Jesus is the Messiah. Down the bottom beneath them you can see all of those religious people hurling abuse at Jesus. And so this is an incredible illustration that really brings to life uh, what this scene must have, must have looked like. Um, so before we read the next portion of scripture about the death uh, of Jesus, which is recorded in John 19, verse 28 to 37. I'm going to, yeah, sorry, I've just shown you, uh, I'm just rereading my notes, I beg your pardon. So we've just shown you those illustrations. So now we're going to go to John 19, verses 28 to 37. So those uh, images there are to give you a, a good understanding of what it must have been like. So John 19, verses 28 to 37. So it reads, Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Remember John writing, he's always saying, and so the scripture will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I'm going to come back to that. Reading on, now it was the day of preparation and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony. This is John speaking because he's there. And his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. Once again, he keeps telling you. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And the first one is, not one of his bones will be broken. Now that comes from three places in the Bible. Exodus 12 verse 46. Numbers 9, verse 12, and Psalm 34, verse 20. And then secondly, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. And that comes from Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 10. So the purpose for the life and ministry of Jesus is accomplished. But Jesus needs to speak. And as Psalm 22, 15 says, that's the reading that I read from, the tongue of Jesus sticks to the roof of his mouth. He's not capable of speaking. So Jesus says in verse 28, I am thirsty, that we just read. After receiving a dilute wine vinegar on a sponge lifted up on the stalk of a hyssop plant, Jesus simply says, it is finished. Now translated, this comes from a Greek word, which is a single word. And it's, it says, tetelestai, T-E-T-E-L-E-S-T-A-I, tetelestai. Now, it's not the words, and this is what's important here and why I bring it up. It's not the words of a loser. It's not, it's finished like, I give up, it's over. Mm -hmm. It's not the words of a loser. Mm -hmm. It's a words that's used for, as the cry of a winner. So if a person had won something, maybe they were doing some sport, Greek Olympics, whatever, they would use this same word, it's finished. That's it, it's done. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the champion. Complete. It's complete. Yeah. Yep. So Jesus finishes his eternal purpose on the cross and today it stands as the very foundation of all Christian peace and faith because it pays the full debt each of us owe to God. Words can change everything. Not guilty in a court of law. Yes to marriage or goodbye to a friend. 
But this single Greek word translated as it is finished impacted this world and the people in it like no other. At some point before Jesus dies, before the veil in the temple of Jerusalem is torn in two, and that's not in John's account, but I've just mentioned it, a spiritual transaction takes place in which God the Father lays upon God the Son all the guilt and wrath of our sin deserves, and Jesus bears it on himself. The prophecies are fulfilled. The sacrifices and ceremonies of the priesthood are finished. So in case you want to know, should I be doing this, practicing Messianic Jewish practice? No, you shouldn't. The satisfaction of God's justice is finished and the power of Satan, sin and death is finished. That's why Jesus says it is finished. All of it's finished. Bowing his head, Jesus is in peace. And as the scripture reveals in verse 30, no one took the life of Jesus because it says he gave up his spirit. He bowed his head. It didn't roll because he lost control. He said it is finished. He bowed his end, his head and gave his spirit up. And I was to the very end, Jesus is in control. So earlier, Jesus said to the Jews, and we covered this in a previous uh, message in John 10 verses 17 to 18 and this is a reminder for us Jesus says the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again no one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again so this is a forewarning of the fact that he's going to be resurrected he's going to rise again but he's telling you that no one's done this to him He's in control. Right, he said this earlier on. Now it was normal for crucified bodies to remain on the crosses as grim warning to those who thought to disobey Roman authority. Yet because of the approaching Sabbath, verse 31 says the Jewish leaders demanded the bodies of Jesus and the other two criminals be taken down and taken away. Their consciences were not worried about the murder of Jesus, but they were concerned about the fear of ceremonial pollution. So this is the Jewish plague, isn't it? Always worried about the little things and yet they're persecuting and killing <laughs> Jesus. So to bring this outcome forward, they ask Pontius Pilate to break the legs of those being crucified because it hastens their deaths because without being able to support themselves, the stress on the lungs actually causes a lack of oxygen and it kills them. So the soldiers broke the legs of the two criminals but not those of Jesus, for they thought he was dead already. Now they noticed they thought he was dead already, but they had to check, they had to test. So what did they do? They took the spear and they pierced his side in order to make sure he was dead. And again, I have an illustration of perhaps what that would look like. And you can see that they literally just cut these bodies down and let them fall. And here's Jesus, they're checking, so they jabbed the spear into his side. And so, once again, he's treated different to the others. Now, in verses 35 to 37, the author of this book, the disciple John, testifies he is present at the crucifixion and saw these things with his own eyes. And most importantly, he gives the reason for his testimony. So that whoever reads what he testifies to will believe that it's truth. He repeats this throughout his gospel. The book of John has a purpose so that anyone who reads it will believe. So for anyone giving advice to a new Christian about what book they should read first, mm. the book of John is really sound oh, advice. Oh, oh. Yeah. If I'm asked, I usually tell people to read Genesis and the book of John. Both start with, in the beginning. Yeah. Right? But the book of John, its whole purpose for being written, is so that those who will read it will believe. So when people are arguing about what you should tell somebody else, start here. Mm. Book of John, good advice. The disciple of Jesus tells us how to manage the situation himself. Mm. So two more Messianic scriptures are mentioned and fulfilled in verses 36 and 37. Verse 36 said, Not one of his bones shall be broken. And so this is the prophecy I mentioned, the scriptures from Psalm 34 verse 20, Exodus 12 verse 46, and Numbers 9 verse 12 is unknowingly fulfilled by a Roman soldier who chose not to break the legs of Jesus, even though it was actually a command of Pontius Pilate. Remember, Jesus, Pontius Pilate said, yes, go ahead. So they're actually meant to do it. So this soldier actually disobeyed Pontius Pilate. 
So it is the exact fulfillment of God's word and should lead you to believe. Mm. Verse 37, they shall look on him whom they pierced. This prophecy of Zechariah 12.10 and 13.6 is again unknowingly fulfilled by a Roman soldier and should also lead you to believe. So let's now read our last little bit of uh, scripture today. And it's about the burial of Jesus in John 19, verse 38 to 42. So John 19, verses 38 to 42. It reads, Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Well, with Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. So who was Nicodemus? He was the, um, the Jewish um, oh, ph- Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, yeah. that's right. Mm-hmm. And, and he, he spoke to him he, specifically, didn't yeah. he? He re- you could tell he really wanted to give his life, but he, he didn't right. want to give his um, right. earthly possessions and right. his right and his, right. and his Pharisaical job. Well done. And so we learn here that the, the seed, if you want to call it, Jesus saved when he spoke to him directly, actually had an outcome. He walked away from Jesus and it doesn't give us an outcome there. But right now we find out here he is, he's standing up and he's going to publicly go out and he's going to pick up the body of Jesus and prepare him for burial. Mm-hmm. But the amount of money that must have cost, that right. Yeah. 10 pounds of... Right, I'm going to oh, 75. No, 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 you're, you're spot on. So he was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, and it says about 75 pounds. In today's measurement, that's 34 kilograms. So 34 kilograms. Now this stuff's really, really expensive. And so it essentially shows the wealth of these men. So taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So for all the journey of the family and Jesus and of his disciples, God raises up two previously secret disciples called Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus to receive the body of Jesus and prepare it for burial in a short period of time before dusk and the beginning of a new day. A special Sabbath. Interesting, isn't it? There's all the disciples, there's the family of Jesus, but those who actually take his body and prepare it for burial were previously secret disciples. Right? His disciples weren't there. It would have been beyond the capacity of the ladies to take care of it. Yeah. And probably not just in a uh, physical sense, but in a, an emotional sense, yeah. it would have been utterly devastating. Mm. So Roman custom was actually to leave the bodies of crucified criminals to rot on the crosses or be eaten by wild animals. I mean, you just can't imagine, can you? But Joseph of Arimathea asks Pontius Pilate for permission to take the body And the Jews also want the bodies of the three crucified men taken away so they don't mar the Sabbath. So as wealthy men, both Joseph and Nicodemus could have used servants to do this task for them, and yet they did this difficult and gruesome task themselves. They followed Jewish custom, but before the body could be wrapped, it is Jewish custom to remove all foreign matter from the body and carefully wash it. And this is where you see love. What they saw was shocking and must have had a lifelong effect on them. You would never, ever get over this. Broken pieces of thorns would have been removed from the head of Jesus where the crown of thorns was placed on his head. The splinters from the rough wooden cross would have been removed from his back. Okay, these things weren't... uh, Mm. Bought from Bunnings and finished nicely. Okay. The beaten nails had to be removed from the bone of his ankles. And they would have to wash his bruised, battered and torn body with shocking wounds. 
and open cavities from the, scour the scourging whip, the thrust of the spear and the dislocated shoulders from being suspended by the arms. Now remember the scriptures, Jesus himself says he's like a worm, like he's got no structure left mm. in his body. Mm. You know, other prophetic scriptures say he's so disfigured and marred he's barely recognisable in human form. Mm. And so what an incredible thing these two men did. Can I just say, um, for people who think that he wasn't dead, you know, like the people say, oh, well, um, how did they know that he was dead? Um, but apparently when you, if you pierce the side of somebody who is dead, then the reason water comes out is because your lungs actually, when on the right. point of asphyxiation, yes. your lungs actually fill up with water. Right. And mm. it, 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 right. kill, it alone Very kills good. you. I didn't put that in here, but the blood yeah. and the water mm. actually come out separately. Right. So in other words, they weren't one fluid, they came out as two sets yeah, of fluid yeah. out of the wound. Mm. And so that's completely correct, because when mm. they put the spear up, it would have gone into the lung. And, and, and they actually it. knew that. They right. knew that, that if that came out like it did, then he's definitely dead. Right, yeah. and hence that's why they did it to yeah, Chief. That's, that's right, very good, mm. excellent. So these men persevered, and they took care of the bloody body of Jesus, and fulfilled yet another prophecy from Isaiah 53 verse 9 which says that the Messiah will be with the rich at his death. Right. So that's Isaiah 53 verse 9. Right. He will be with the rich at his death. Right. So Jesus is buried in a garden tomb wrapped in fine linen and anointed with a mixture of myrrh and aloes only a rich man could afford. This was not to show the wealth of these men but rather shows their reverence for which they treated the body of Jesus. Mm. Matthew 27 verse 60 says the tomb belongs to Joseph of Arimathea. Mm -hmm. And so he actually gave up his own tomb mm. and was sealed by a stone to ensure no one could disturb the remains. Mm. I just want you to know in these tombs in these days that once the body had decayed, they would actually go back in and they would collect the bones and they would put them in a box. Right? And then the box would actually be put aside and other people would be buried in the same mm -hmm. place. And that's why there's a story in the Bible. Well, actually, it's not in the Bible, but I've taught this in my lessons, where they actually found one of these boxes for King Uzziah with his bones in there. And so he's no longer a body. He was a collection of bones in a box right. with a written inscription on the front of the box. It was found mm. in a Russian Orthodox church, I believe. No. But it went back to where it should go. No. But the fact is these boxes are what they do. Yeah. And so because it's a chamber, if you will, close the chamber, protect the body. Mm. Several years later, they take the, the bones, they put them in this thing. And then, of yeah. course, other family members or oh. whatever. So it's highly likely that Joseph himself was potentially buried in that same place right. later on when he too passed away. Incredible story. Huh? Mm. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our message today. Um, quite a, uh, a difficult message, obviously. Mm. Quite painful to think about. Uh, if you love the Lord, uh, it should be painful to think about. And if you love the Lord, it should have such an impact on you what you went through mm. that you can see how much He loves you. And so we have to give thanks for what He did. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this message. I just really thank the disciple John. You know, the scriptures tell us that the disciples all forsook Jesus and ran away, but John did too, but he came back. And he was there right through all of this, and he did it just so that he could record for our benefit, Lord, exactly what happened so that we too could know not just that Jesus was the Messiah, but know in such a way that we too can believe. It's just an incredible testimony that John's life was driven by thinking about those who haven't even yet been born. He spent his time writing in order that all people in the future would be able to read this scripture and know that Jesus is the Messiah know that Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies so that we too can be sure that we are in fact worshipping Jesus, the Son of God. So Lord, we thank you for today. We just pray that your word goes out 
and that it touches people, it perplexes people, it challenges people, and makes them think about life, makes them think about death, makes them think about their faith, what they believe. Lord, I ask that the Holy Spirit goes out with this word and touches the hearts and changes people's lives forever. That people understand that there is life after death and that Jesus came to overcome sin in order to defeat the devil once and for all. So Lord, corporately we thank you today that you loved us so much that you gave your only son in such a difficult circumstance, such a painful suffering, just so that our sins could be atoned. So we thank you today and we ask you to bless this word in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. you